Hello everyone, I'm Phil Dickens, and this is From the Hill of Megiddo, the podcast serialization of my book of the same name. This book tells the story of three protagonists from very different backgrounds, as they're thrown into what might well be the end of the world. In this first episode, we're going to dive straight into the prologue and see what kicks this all off. And in chapter one, we'll meet Miles, the first of our protagonists. I hope you enjoy it. From the Hill of Megiddo by Philip Dickens. Prologue. The full moon shone the deep red of spilled blood high above the ruins of Tal Megiddo. Gaspar glanced at her only briefly, thinking it somewhat unusual before his thoughts went elsewhere. There were more important matters to worry about than the colour of the moon, after all. His hands were bound, and he wasn't being restrained. The kidnapper had been clear that he should walk freely, as if it were his own choice to be there. Perhaps he could have run, but the truth was that he was afraid to. He knew nothing of the man walking several steps behind him, not whether he could run fast, or even if he had a gun, but there was something about him that made Gaspar go cold. He just knew that if he tried to run, then the man would make him pay. He hadn't even gotten a good look at the man. That was part of the problem. The way he had just appeared in the back of Gaspar's car. No, he must have smuggled himself in and waited for the right moment to reveal himself, surely. Either way, it had shaken him up enough that he hadn't questioned the command to turn off the road. And he wasn't questioning the one to keep walking now. Leaving the car park and the illumination of the streetlights, the world around him quickly darkened. It was almost silent too, save his own footfalls and the occasional whoosh of a car going down Highway 66. There was no wind, making the heat of the summer's night stifling. He could feel the sweat forming on the nape of his neck and under his arms as he climbed. The dead city-state was not a large place by modern standards. Moonlight reduced the distance to a silhouette, the shape of palm trees rising above the crests and troughs of rock and stone around the hill. His immediate vicinity was grey, his eyes barely making out the carved trenches, the ruined rock walls, the dry hard ground which crunched underfoot. But he wasn't there to admire the scenery, the presence of his captor still looming just behind him, and so he pushed on across the excavations. Here we are, the man said, his voice low and rough, as though he had spent a lifetime smoking. The only thing that Gaspar could see nearby was a deep crater in the ground with grass overgrown around the walls. The steps here were far more modern than the site. Freshly painted handrails at their edge. They led down into total darkness. His heart rate quickened and his legs felt less steady than they had been. He took a deep breath and took hold of the handrails. What? Why are we here? He asked. It will become clear soon enough. Go on. But move. The voice brooked no argument, and so he went forward. The steps took him into the rock, where the underground shaft quickly enveloped him in black. The steel clang of his footfalls became a wooden clack as he reached the older stairwell. There was something odd about the sound, and he couldn't quite put his finger on it, until he realised that he could only hear one set of footsteps. He looked back. It was too dark to see anything. But a voice just above him said, I'm still here, don't worry. It would have been easier not to worry if the man hadn't been there. Still, there was nothing else to do. He pushed ahead blind, willing his heart to beat slower and his breath to come softer, in both cases to no avail. There was a tightness across his chest which only increased when he saw the black give way to a green glow up ahead. He had reached the spring. As the light from the waters came up to meet him, he was able to see the partition erected to stop tourists getting wet. And even now he himself accompanies me, and he himself keeps and protects me, he recited under his breath. And in his power I fight with Ars and Achriman, and teach men wisdom and knowledge and save them from Ars and Achriman. When he had gone as far as he could, he turned to see the shadow of a man separate itself from the darkness. It stopped before it reached enough light that he might have been able to make out features. Gaspar's heart pounded in his ears. So then, the man said, it's time that we were properly introduced, is it not? Gaspar had no idea what to say. It, yes, yes. Well then, your name? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Gas, Gaspar, it's Gaspar. 
The man stepped forward, and Gaspar saw that he was dressed in a black suit and a lilac shirt. It is nice to meet you, Gaspar. My name is Lucius. His hair was short and neat, his face plain and his skin white. He moved close enough to clap Gaspar on the shoulder. I would like to apologise for the circumstances of our meeting. I'm afraid it was necessary. The moon will only shine with blood for so long, and the offering must be made in very specific conditions. Offering? Gaspar asked, his breath quickening so much that he struggled to take in air. What offering? Lucius put a hand on his chest. You're having a panic attack. Slow your breathing. With me. In. Gaspar breathed in, Lucius pressing firmly on his chest. Out. Gaspar breathed out again, his head already starting to clear with that rush of air. And again. In. Out. In. Out. Feel better? Gaspar swallowed and nodded. Yes, I do. He couldn't contain his surprise. Lucius put an arm around Gaspar and guided him to the spring. Now, you're here because you were raised in a fate that is supposed to be long dead. Manichaeism is bland and derivative as cults go, it must be said, but for some reason the blood of true believers has more than its fair share of uses in ritual. His blood? Gaspar's stomach seized up. Lucius's grip around his shoulders was strong, but fear had frozen Gaspar anyway so that he couldn't struggle. A craven faith yours, which I suppose makes it an irony how useful the blood of your true believers can be in the dark arts. Gaspar's head pounded, blood pulsed in his ears. His legs felt as though they were collapsing under him, though Lucius's grip meant he wouldn't fall. Lucius raised his free hand and glanced at his watch. Anyway, time is wasting. In response, Gaspar offered only a choked grunt. The sound of steel being drawn was unmistakable, and a moment later the tip of a short, curved blade was at his throat, sharp and cold. Why? he managed to say. If you're going to kill me, at least tell me why. Why would I do that? his killer asked as he drew the blade across his throat. It's not as though knowing would make a difference to you anyway. The bite of the blade caught Gaspar's Adam's apple mid-swallow. He gagged as the blood filled his throat. His body arched forward and Lucius bent him over the partition to the spring. His stomach roiled. His throat grew tighter and his mouth fell open. The blood spilling thick from both there and the gash in his throat. His strength fled him quickly, but it felt a lifetime before Lucius let him fall limp into the partition. The world spun and his vision went from green to grey before fading to black. All senses fled him, and he met the mercy of the Great Spirit. Far above where he died, in the view of the Red Moon, a hail of shooting stars scarred the night sky. Act 1. Broken Seals Chapter 1 Miles Darheen was early, because of course he was. It was an uncanny knack that he had when he was trying to turn up late, or at least not first, that everything would take far less time to do than normal. Even the buses, normally reliably late, would arrive not just on time, but actually early or late enough to coincide with him reaching the bus stop. So it was that he reached the city centre almost an hour before he was actually supposed to be there, probably longer before his friends would actually arrive. He jumped off the bus a stop late to delay himself slightly. If he had gotten off by the Adelphi Hotel, he would have had a much shorter walk to McKenna's. From Queen Square, if he dawdled, he could possibly stretch out when he arrived so that he wasn't standing around on his own for too long. He could have gone inside early instead and talked to Lydia. That nearly made him laugh. What would they have to talk about? Even if she wouldn't have been busy serving, what could he say that would give her any reason to be interested? No, that wasn't going to happen. It was just past nine and the sky was beginning to darken, the first street lights coming on. Around him, most of the people moving about had bags of shopping with them, heading for the bus or the train as the shops began to close. They had fair rides in Williamson Square, though, as one tired mother was struggling to get through to her crying child, they had stopped running for the night. This point was underlined by the group of goths sitting on the edge of the merry-go-round, smoking roll-ups and glaring at anybody who came too close to them. Miles slowed down. Had one of them been staring at him? He was sure that somebody pale with spiky jet black hair had been standing behind them or he had only looked that way for a couple of seconds he stopped and looked back there was nobody there 
he shook his head and carried on, though now there was a cold feeling on the back of his neck. It was forgotten once he came out onto Church Street and turned in the direction of Bold Street. Just a few hours earlier in the day, this part of town would have been packed. He would have needed to move in constant zigzags just to keep going forwards. But now there were only a few small clusters of people passing in different directions and a couple of buskers still playing as long as there was money to be made. He did a double take over the road when a group of three women in washed out jeans and skater t-shirts walked past him. One of them had thick auburn hair, almost orange, and for a split second he thought it was Lydia. It wasn't. He was younger and scowled when she caught him looking at her. Once they were further on, he heard them laughing. At him, perhaps. Miles stuck his hands in his pockets and kept walking. It was darker now, and there were a lot less shoppers around. More people who at least looked like they were heading to a club. Good. Not that he did, really. Since McKenna's wasn't exactly a shared shoes and trousers kind of venue. But at least it suggested that he was no longer out too early. Although when he checked his phone, he was proven wrong since it seemed he had managed to get halfway across town in less than 15 minutes. He was in the shadow of the bombed out church, properly St. Luke's, an Anglican church that World War II had reduced to a sandstone ruin, and only a short walk up Harpen Street away from McKenna's. He sighed. He was going to be waiting around either way, and having a drink in his hand would at least pass the time quicker than walking around the block more than once. Hopefully. If you didn't know McKenna's, you would take one look through the glass facade and assume that it was closed. Beyond the small foyer, the bar, dance floor, couches and tables were shrouded in darkness. Having frequented the place intermittently since he was 16, and pretty much every weekend for the last three years, Miles knew just to push the door open and head downstairs. It wasn't much lighter down here, but the gloom was more purposeful. The spacing of the small spotlights on the ceiling meant to give that effect. There were already a handful of people here, mostly propping up the walls with a bottle in hand, and a band was setting up in the opposite corner to the bar. Behind the bar, of course, was Lydia McKenna. A short feathered bob of auburn hair, framed cheeks spotted with freckles, dark green eyes and full lips that lit her face up when she smiled. When she spotted him and waved, he realised that he had been staring and made his way over to the bar. Hey chick, she said. What can I get you? Alright, uh, I'll have a bud please. As she turned around to get a bottle from the fridge, he grasped for something to say. Lacking for anything more profound, he went with, So, how are you anyway? She shrugged. Oh, I'm alright, you know. How about you? Not bad. Not much to tell, really. He trailed off. There had to be something they could get into a real conversation about. That was when he saw the Download Festival wristband on her left arm. He nodded at it. How was it then? What? She looked down at her wrist and, when she realised what he meant, laughed. Oh, that was last year's? Really? Yeah, getting them to last this long without falling apart is an art form, you know. They both laughed, but the laughter quickly faded away and they were left there in silence. Miles searched for something else to say. There had to be something, but nothing offered itself up. He cleared his throat and took a swig of his drink. Something at the other end of the bar caught Lydia's attention. I'll catch up with you later, alright, chick? She smiled at him, but then was gone, heading over to somebody else who wanted serving. Probably relieved to be, too. It had to be more interested than enduring him staring at her while struggling for something to say. Shortly, the silence was broken by music that was too loud to hear anything else over it. The band was still setting up, but this marked the proper start of the night. The lights faded away, only to be replaced by strobe lights which sliced through the darkness in time with the music. More people came downstairs, and those that were already there moved away from the walls and onto the dance floor. His bottle was almost gone by the time his sister appeared. Jess was the same height as him, six foot one, but taller with her steel plated boots on, and her dark red dyed hair styled into a high thick crest. The sides of her head were shaved. She was wearing thick black eyeliner and black lipstick which emphasised how pale her skin was. Her sleeveless top showed off toned, strong arms, one completely covered by a sleeve of tattoos, and one by a half sleeve that reached up from her wrist to her elbow. She ruffled up Miles' collar-length hair as she reached them and put her mouth to his ear to say, Who's pissed on your chips? He scrunched his face up in confusion. What? Oh, no, I'm fine. Tell your face then, eh, kid? She squeezed his shoulder, then leaned on the bar. 
A moment later, Lydia greeted her with two bottles and a kiss on the cheek. After they had spoken, Jess took the bottles and presented one to Miles. They were on their third drink by the time everyone else arrived. As they were ahead, Jess insisted on shots for everybody to catch up. Two rounds of them later, and Miles had a pleasant tingle in his head. The dance floor was packed now. Nearby, the shirtless fat man got a bit too enthusiastic trying to get mosh pits started and sent a rake of a boy with uneven stubble skidding across the floor. Around him, a hundred odd people danced and drank and kissed and noticed nothing beyond their own little worlds. Miles sank another four bottles without thinking about it. As he made his way back to the bar, itself a dance considering how many people he had to squeeze past and how many groups he had to shuffle through the middle of, he got the feeling that somebody was watching him. The tingling heat on the hairs at the back of his neck. He turned and scanned the crowds, not expecting to see anything. He tensed, however, when again he saw the man with spiky black hair that he had seen earlier. This time the watcher turned away and ducked into the crowd. Miles craned his head and stood up on tiptoes trying to catch sight of him again. A hand slapped him on the back and he jumped, ending a snarl from the short woman he nearly fell over. When he turned around, Kit Sanders was laughing so hard that he was clutching his belly. Sorry mate, didn't mean to scare you. Miles looked around again, but there was no sign whatsoever of the man, so he returned his attention to Kit. It's alright. Looking for someone? Miles shook his head. Alright, well if you're after a drink, it's my round. Kit was large in every sense of the word. At six foot five, he towered even over Miles and Jess, and with a shaved head, big arms and barrel chest, he looked intimidating. Although now the biggest threat he posed was that he was drunk enough to fall over and crush somebody underneath him. No, it's not. Oh, well even so, he shoved his hand in his pocket. Miles grabbed his arm. Stop it, daft ass. A barmaid came over to them and Miles ordered the drinks. Kit stuck out his hand with a note in it and Miles shoved it away. You're not allowed to take money off him, love, so just ignore him. The barmaid raised an eyebrow, a smirk on her face. Oh, why is that then? He robbed the bank, but the money's marked, so he's trying to get rid of it. He leaned in closer and traced a finger over his hand. I suppose you'd have to put me in handcuffs then? Well, you'd have been bad, so I'd have no choice. Biting her lip, she reached over and took a note off Kit. When she gave him his change, she also handed something to Miles. Opening it up, he saw that it was a phone number. Kit was staring at him, shaking his head. What? It just amazes me how you can do that, but as soon as you're actually interested in a girl, you turn into a complete meth. Miles punched Kit in the arm before picking up the drinks and heading back from the bar. Kit followed him, laughing. As the night wore on, Miles' head got fuzzier. They completely lost track of time. At some point towards the end of the night, five of them ended up occupying a booth upstairs. Kit was completely non-verbal at this point. He tried to speak a couple of times, but the incoherent noise that had come out had everyone in hysterics so he had stopped after that. He was still drinking steadily though. Jess, on the other hand, appeared almost entirely sober. She was on at least her twelfth drink, excluding shots of which she had down more than a few, but wasn't so much as slurring her words. There was movement next to the booth, and Miles looked over to see Michelle standing by them. She was almost as tall as Jess, but with a slender dancer's body. Her hair was an electric purple, and her skin was milk white. She was swaying slightly dancing but not in time to any music they could hear. Alright chick, wonder where you got to? Jess said. Michelle grinned. Well, I met this lad, didn't I? We're getting off now, so I'm just here to say ta-ra. Jess looked past her towards the foyer and nodded her approval. Nice one. Miles found himself turning around to look, and for a moment he thought he was seeing things. It was the man with the spiky back hair. He blinked several times to be sure that he wasn't imagining it then squinted. There was something off about him, something he couldn't put his finger on. A pulse inside his head, nagging at him like the beginning of a migraine. The man didn't so much as look at Miles now, but it didn't make him feel any better. When he turned away, however, the feeling faded. Give us a bell in the morning, Jess was saying. I want details. They hugged. Michelle gave the rest of the group a wave, and then she skipped off. Kit nudged Miles. When he looked, Kit didn't try to say anything, but he did raise his eyebrows. It was enough to get his meaning across. It's nothing, mate. I'm fine. He must have been imagining things. He shook his head, took a swig of his drink, 
and tried to put it out of his mind. Another hour or so later, Miles felt queasy as he downed the last dregs of his drink. He pulled his phone out of his pocket to check the time. Quarter to five. He'd lost count of how much he had drunk, but it was a lot, and he hadn't eaten since lunch. He leaned over the table and punched his older sister in the arm. Jess responded by slapping him across the head. Tit. Ow, he said. You just fancy getting off, grabbing some scram? Most of the group shrugged or nodded. Kit said something that might have been, I could murder a kebab. Whatever, Jess said. But let us finish our drinks first, eh? Sam? He stood up. Uh, I'll be back in a bit. Don't worry. We'll wait while you get nervous at Lydia. Jess said with a smirk. Kit laughed and snorted beer out of his nose. Oh, fuck off. Miles said before heading to the bar in the basement. He found himself an empty spot and leaned over the bar. Lydia spotted him and came over. All right, chick. Last order is gone, you know. What can I get you? No. I mean, I'm fine, he said. Uh, we were just about to go and get a burger or a pizza or something. What time did you get off? Not for a bit, because I've got to close up. I'm going to be a bore and head straight home for a kip. Sorry. Oh, no worries. He paused. You'll have to get a weekend off soon, so you can come out with us. Sounds like a plan. She winked at him, and he felt his stomach tense. Jess and Kit came down the stairs. Looks like we're off then. Probably catch you tomorrow, then. When she mimed a kiss, his face flushed and he stammered. So, uh, see you later. Jess came over and shoved him. She leaned over the bar and hugged Lydia before they headed back upstairs. Outside, Miles pulled his pack of cigarettes from his jeans. Jess snatched them from him and said, Yoink! As she did, though she was gracious enough to stick a cigarette in his mouth and return the pack once she had taken one for herself. She lit hers first and then his as she exhaled her first drag. They headed downhill towards the centre of town. At the intersection with Pilgrim Street, Miles' eyes drifted towards a young woman limping on bare feet across cobbles, whilst her boyfriend held her arm and her shoes with the six-inch heels. Beyond them, there was a slumped shape. That's not right. He stopped. Even though he could only see the shadow, it was clearly a person propped against the skip. There was something about how limp the arms and head hung. All the laughter had died in his throat, and cold traced its way up his spine. Despite the summer heat, he shuddered. Miles? Jess had gotten a few steps ahead of him before she noticed he had stopped. What's up? Why are you... She followed his gaze and let out a breath. She took a step forward. Oh, fuck. 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 All the colour had drained from her face. Her breathing became quick and shallow. Stealing himself, Miles forced himself to walk forward. His stomach lurched and he felt incredibly faint as he took in the scene. He put a hand on Jess's shoulder, but the figure against the skip was all he could see. Everything else had bled away. There was only the corpse. Michelle's corpse. Blinking, he forced his head away and noticed that his best mate wasn't with them. Kit! His voice quavered as he called out and didn't travel far. He cleared his throat. Kit! This time the shout was loud enough, and after a moment Kit reappeared at the entrance to Pilgrim Street. He strolled back to where the other three stood. What's the old up? I'm starving here. Shut up and just get here. I'm serious, I'm... Um... Jess snapped out of her trance. Kit, just shut the fuck up. Get here now. The voice raised to a screech. Kit ran over to them. When he reached them, he opened his mouth to speak, but snapped it shut again when his eyes fell on the body. He turned away. Only Jess was still staring at it, her eyes wide. Miles was watching Kit's reaction. He, too, had gone pale and was swaying slightly on his feet. Who? What? What? I don't know, Miles said. We need to call the police. That was when Jess threw up. Very much for listening. If you enjoyed this and want more, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, AK Black and Red, or search for From the Hill of Megado on your favourite podcast service. Next week, we'll be going into chapters 2 and 3 to meet our other protagonists, Hazel and Anil. See you then.